A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Now wait a minute. Is that really what a psychopath is? Um, the general population has quite a lot of misconceptions about what exactly a psychopath is and what a psychopath looks like. Um, so in this video, I'm going to be addressing the seven most common myths that people do have about psychopathy. Um, I'm an undergraduate student uh, at the University of British Columbia. I'm doing a double major in computer science and psychology. Um, I do work in a few labs, one in which uh, we do investigate uh, psychopathy in the general population. Um, in relation to something that we call the dark triad. But uh, I have been following uh, the research in academia regarding psychopathy for a little under a decade now. Um, so I do know a little bit about it, but by all means, I'm just an undergrad. You know, I have, I'm, I've barely got my feet wet when it comes to research, so this is just my synthesis on what I've collected so far. Um, so before we talk about the seven myths, let's talk about what is psychopathy? What is it? Um, psychopathy is a personality disorder characterized by a cluster of features that we sort into something called factors. Um, so these include interpersonal manipulation, um, someone who lacks empathy, lacks remorse, and is generally an impulsive person. Um, psychopathy as a construct, being called or with the label psychopathy, hasn't been around for that long. Um, it was first introduced by this really cool guy named Hervey Cleckley in uh, 41. He published, he published a, a book called The Mask of Sanity. Um, if any of you are interested, I do have a copy of it on my hard drive if you want to take a look at that. Um, but you can probably find copies uh, down at your local library. Um, and then along came uh, Dr. Bob Hare. Um, Bob Hare, he's a, he seems to be a pretty cool guy. Um, he actually did all his research uh, here at the University of British Columbia. Um, and he, he and his colleagues created something called the Psychopathy Checklist, and now the Psychopathy Checklist revised. I'll be abbreviating, abbreviating that in this video as the PCLR. Um, it's the PCLR is generally considered the gold standard when it comes to psychopathy. Um, basically what it is, is that it is a scoring system or a psychological assessment in which an individual receives a score from 0 to 40. Um, and if you, if you receive a score of 30 or over, you are given the clinical or research uh, label psychopath. Um, Hare puts the estimate of psychopathy at a little bit under 1% in your general population. Of course, it is much higher in criminal populations, but I'll get into that later. But psychopathy, since it is on a scale from 0 to 40, uh, it is a gradient. What this means is that everybody has psychopathic traits to some degree or another. Um, your, the, sort of your general population tends to score any, you know, um, around 5. Um, you'd be interested to know, actually, Bob Harris scored himself um, anywhere from about a 4 to a 6 on the PCLR. Um, within incarcerated populations, this number is a bit higher. Um, in prison populations, this tends to hover in the low 10s and the 20s. Um, but again, you do, need to be, uh, you do need to score 30 or over to be considered a psychopath. Um, so yeah, there are two factors in the PCLR, the first one being interpersonal and affective. Affective is basically just a fancy psychological jargon word for emotional. Um, you, may, you may catch me using that word because it's, it's a hard habit to break. Um, the second factor you have is something called antisocial lifestyle behavior. Um, so this includes, say, items like juvenile delinquency, need for stimulation, someone who really doesn't have you know, a long-term life plan. Um, so basically, if you want to sort of summarize this, PCLR measures psychopathy. It is separated into two factors. The first factor is primarily sort of the, um, the personality, interpersonal, emotional factors. Factor two um, deals with behaviors. Uh, myth number one, psychopaths are crazy. I, I, love, this. I love this myth. Um, you hear this all the time, and I think a lot of you um, probably have this myth sort of ingrained in your psyche. Psychopaths are crazy. Um, the reason this myth, I think, is so prevalent is because the way that your, your, average, your average person uses the word crazy and the way that, say, clinicians and researchers use the word crazy are, are quite different. Um, you know, when, you're, when your average person says crazy, they're talking about something that is, you know, not understandable or maybe a bit extreme. You know, oh my god, I can't believe, you know, she dumped that guy. He was so hot. You know, she must be crazy. Um, Whereas when clinicians and researchers use it, uh, we, we, use, we refer to it as psychotic or psychosis. The interesting thing here to note is that the majority of psychopaths are not, are not psychotic. They do not exhibit psychotic features. Um, the DSM-4, uh, which is largely considered the sort of the psych diagnosis manual, the DSM-4 talks about psychosis in terms of someone who has had a genuine break from reality. 
Um, so this person may experience, say, hallucin uh, hallucinations, audio or visual, um, command hallucinations, um, someone who experiences delusions, you know, uh, so maybe a grandiosity with religious themes. Um, there's a lot more to it, but the key point here is that psychopaths are maybe a di bit different than most people think. They're certainly uh, deviant in terms of, you know, the behavior and personality constructs of your average person, but are they psychotic? No. Um, psychopaths are not psychotic. Um, so myth number two, myth number two is, aha, uh -huh, psychopath equals serial killer. Here's the thing to wrap your brain around, okay? Um, most serial killers are psychopaths. However, most psychopaths are not serial killers. Furthermore, um, the majority of psychopaths are not even criminals. Criminality in terms of a psychopath is, has been quite contested as recently as you know, last month. Um, however, it's generally accepted now that criminality is a correlate of psychopathy. So a correlate is something that is just associated with. It doesn't mean in any way that being a psychopath causes you to commit crime. However, a lot of psychopaths um, do commit crimes. Um, albeit if they're good at hiding it, uh, they may go undetected for a very long period of time. Um, this, I think this, the reason for this myth is because of the media. I mean, uh, you take a look at, let's say, I, a lot of you probably watch Criminal Minds, yeah? Um, Criminal Minds is sort of this, it's sort of this vice in academia. No one wants to admit that they actually watch Criminal Minds, but I love the show. But Criminal Minds um, is about as accurate as CSI, which is not very accurate. Psychopaths, uh, the majority of them, again, are not criminal, are not in jail. Um, think about this for a second, right? Uh, psychopaths account for about 1% of the general population. However, psychopaths account for only about, you know, around a quarter um, to a third of the, of the prison population. The question becomes, where did all those other psychopaths go? Um, well, they are living among us. You know, it's not as creepy as it sounds, but anyway. Now, myth number three, uh, all psychopaths are violent criminals. This is an interesting one. Um, I've heard a lot of my friends use this. They say, oh, you know, that guy was a freaking psychopath, man. You know, he just killed that kid in cold blood. Um, again, this is not true. The vast majority of psychopaths are not in prison. Um, many of them, in fact, don't have criminal records. Whether or not it's because they've never been caught or maybe they just don't engage in uh, certain felony crimes, we don't know. But statistically speaking, um, no. The vast majority of psychopaths are not violent criminals. In fact, if they had to commit any sort of crime, it would probably non be non-violent crime um, that has, say, related to or has some sort of financial or economic benefit. So they're gaining something from this. Because psychopaths are what we call instrumental aggressors. They utilize aggression as a tool, um, as a means to an end, rather than an end in itself. Um, and then, of course, uh, Hare and his colleague, I think in the UK, they actually wrote a recent uh, book called Snakes and Suits. I'm sure many of you have heard of this or maybe read it. Fascinating read, where he talks about white-collar psychopaths and about how a uh, disproportionate number of psychopaths can be found in the upper echelons of, say, large companies and corporations. This is an interesting one because it's, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? I mean, if you're in this really cutthroat business world, um, and you're, you know, you're the CEO or the junior or vice CEO or whatever. Um, think about what it took for you to get there. You probably had to flatter a lot of people. You probably had to manipulate a lot of people. You probably had to lie quite a lot. Maybe you had to boast or exaggerate, you know, your credentials and your achievements here and there. Um, which psychopaths do engage in? Um, that's, you know, those are some of the diagnostic features of a psychopath. It's, it's kind of funny and it's, it's kind of not. Um, but like I mentioned, psychopaths, in fact, only account for about anywhere from a fifth to a quarter of the prison population. However, psychopaths account for more than 50% of violent crime. So it, it, the clinical picture of this is you have a very, very small group of individuals who are committing the vast majority of violent crime. Um, so this is in part why uh, research in, say, rehabilitating psychopaths has just, you know, it's, it's exploded in the recent decades um, because they have found this. Uh, psychopaths also have a much higher rate of what we call recidivism. So that is, when, in comparison to other criminals, um, when they're released, they have a much, much higher probability of reoffending. Um, myth number four, most people can 